Whitcomb didn't look at the wing and fuselage as separate entities. He looked at them as one combined body and measured the increase in the cross-sectional area along that body. He postulated that perhaps if you look in a more global sense of what the air had to do going around this vehicle, that if you made a Coke bottle shape, in other words, made the fuselage thinner where the wings got thicker and smoothed out the area over the curve, that you might reduce the drag. Whitcomb proposed the fuselage should be sucked in where the wings connect to compensate for their additional volume. What the air sees is now a smoother increase and decrease in the volume of aircraft passing through it. It was not the individual parts, but the total cross-sectional area that counted. And by indenting the fuselage, you improve it. This principle became known as area rule. The F-102 was reshaped according to that principle. The jet had changed the shape of the high-flying interceptor and thrust the warplane to speeds that would continue to mold it to the shape it has become today. The jet engine was a giant leap forward for the warplane, and now everything else has caught up. Swept wings, all moving control surfaces, new materials, and digital avionics beneath its aluminium and composite skin. If there's one more chapter in the story of the jet, it's the metamorphosis of one warplane into another. The helicopter gunship. This is the very latest helicopter to join the US Marine Corps, the Cobra Zulu. At Patuxent River Naval Base in Maryland, they're developing and testing the latest rotary-winged warplanes. Like its fixed-wing siblings, the Cobra is bristling with the latest technology. We're standing in front of AH-1Z, which is our newest Super Cobra. Now we have mission computers on this aircraft, the first time for the Cobra family. A huge leap to the 21st century since we designed these airplanes originally back in the 50s and 60s. The weapon system's all integrated on a mission grip, which looks a lot like your Atari or Xbox or PlayStation mission grip. So your kids are learning how to fly this helicopter today. It was an idea that had been around since the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century. But the helicopter didn't fly until pioneers like Fokker in Germany and Ukrainian emigre Sikorsky in the USA put 20th century technology to work on a 500-year-old idea. This is Igor Sikorsky at the controls of his first test flight in 1939. By the Korean War in 1950, the helicopter had found a vital humanitarian role. The major issue in the Korean War was getting the injured out and back to field hospitals as quickly as possible. The helicopter proved a lifesaver. However, its large, heavy piston engine limited its potential. Here we have a, a typical radial piston engine from the 40s, early 50s. Big, bulky, heavy, lots of things to go wrong with it. And then in the mid-50s, along came the turboshaft engine, far smaller, much lighter, much, much simpler, and twice, three times as much power. In the helicopter, the jet engine doesn't use its power for thrust, like in a jet plane, Instead, its power turns a shaft that drives the rotor blades, and it would transform the helicopter. You could now carry more, you had more power, and also the engines were much simpler, so they were much more reliable. A new generation of helicopter emerged. At the forefront was... As an air ambulance, it arrived in time for the Vietnam War. Well, the Huey was originally designed for the air ambulance role, but it very quickly became apparent that it could do more than that. The extra power, payload and reliability provided by the jet engine made the helicopter a versatile machine. 
as good as this aircraft was at bringing wounded soldiers off the battlefield, maybe it would do just as good at putting them into the battlefield to begin with. And thus the idea of vertical envelopment came about. Vertical envelopment meant dropping troops into hot landing zones. It was a dangerous job for the new air cavalry and the Huey needed protection. Guns and rockets were fixed on the sides and a gunship version was soon flying in convoy with the troop carriers. The problem came that the Huey, which was carrying all the armament, was slower than the helicopter which was carrying the troops. And so that was why they decided to start looking at developing a particular attack helicopter, which would be faster, which would be more streamlined, um, which would just carry a gunner and a pilot. And that essentially was the, the birth of the attack helicopter. That attack helicopter was the Cobra, and it's been in action ever since. Here at Lager in Germany, experienced pilots have been sent back to school to learn to fly their latest warplane. And the fight's on. Typhoon 1, uh, wind is calm, you are cleared for takeoff. Typhoon 1, cleared takeoff. These pilots will fly many hours on computer simulators before they're allowed anywhere near the cockpit of their new delivery, the Eurofighter. This uh, simulator in particular is uh, used for uh, cockpit familiarization, uh, basic instrument flying, emergency procedures, and uh, intercept procedures. We start out here to train the first uh, Eurofighter pilots of the uh, German Air Force. So it's uh, not only a training for them to fly the aircraft, it's also a training for them to become familiar with the simulator that they can train later on the students in the simulator. After hundreds of simulated missions on the ground, the pilots are finally ready for their first flight. And so too is their new production warplane. After 10 years of meticulous testing, it finally joins its first active squadron here in Germany. The crew represents a thousand hours of training, the warplane a hundred years of technical evolution. And when the cockpit is closed, the two come together in unprecedented unison. The computer flies the plane, the man flies the mission. Technology never stands still. Its evolution is slow and incremental. But every so often, along comes a shockwave that changes everything. The jet created that shockwave. It redrafted the blueprint of the warplane and gave it the thrust to form a series of new shapes and fulfill a multitude of roles. The jet took the warplane from the 20th century to the 21st. No warplane and no war would ever be the same again.